Hey guys, so yeah, it's Saturday again, and um, I'm still missing all of my marbles. Um, I went to the flea market again, I found a, very, a couple of very interesting things. But first of all, um, I wanted to tell you that I'm probably going to do a video about some stuff uh, Jaromir sent me, and I'm going to give you a small teaser. So. One of the things that he sent me is this baggie of a thing called SI NPN. So it's a silicon NPN transistor, but just look at it. I don't know if you can see it. So uh, what Yaramir told me is that this is a, it's like a prototyping tool for when you make hybrids, a, um, hybrids like ceramic hybrids, RF hybrids and stuff like that. And the tiny black ball of epoxy with the three leads, I don't even know if you can see the leads, is the transistor itself. And you're meant to wire bond this on whatever your ceramic substrate or whatever it is, and um, um, integrate it into your application. And if you're developing a hybrid, this is a very consistent uh, characteristics of, uh, like it's a very consi consistently rated transistor. Um, and you know that your circuit is going to behave properly when you start production. So, uh, if, you know, if this is just a small teaser of what Yaromir sent me, you can imagine that the rest of the things are quite a, quite a bit cooler. Like, not necessarily cooler, but they're going to be as cool as this or better. Okay, so, uh, I have a cold. Um, I don't know where I got it, so I might sound a bit funny in this video, but I'll try and uh, minimize my sneezing on camera and um, try and be as um, normal in my speaking voice as possible. So, uh, without further ado, let's start out with this thing, which I'm pretty sure that you will by now recognize as being some sort of a dial from a military piece of equipment. Um, it's very dirty, and I actually hesitated to show you this, because, um, well, why? It's, the, the light makes it very hard to see, but that is actually radium paint. I know, I know, I know, I know, this is very bad. It's uh, made in, I think it's made in Ukraine. Um, it says 27V something like that, so I, it's not volts, it's got to be something else. Um, maybe a serial number or something like that, or a model. Um, I'm not entirely sure what it's supposed to measure. Uh, maybe somebody could translate what that means. Um, it caps out at 1050 and it starts at zero, so... Yeah, the typical military style of construction. I'm not sure if this was for a plane or something else, but yeah. Speaking of, um, why do they put radium paint and stuff? Well, first of uh, the things is that they used to be glowy. They used to glow in the dark. I think Panerai actually had a watch uh, made, meant for divers, for military divers, which also had radium paint in their... Um, in the what do you call them, the hands of the watch, and um, the radioactivity emitted by the radium decaying would basically excite a phosphor and make it glow all the time. Now, watches that glow in the dark today, like mine, the, don't really um, have um, radiation in them. They don't have any radioactive material. Some might have a bit of tritium, which is far safer than... Uh, um, radium, but most of them are just phosphors, so they have a very long decay time, so they soak up some energy, get excited, and then they decay emitting light over a long period of time. This would have glown even in pitch blackness without being exposed to light for years on end, and uh, as long as the phosphor is still active, uh, it would have glown. Um, it stops glowing not when the radiation decays completely, because radium has a pretty long uh, half-life, but it, it stops when the phosphor is completely destroyed, uh, it, when it cannot long uh, no longer function as a phosphorus. So, um, let me take out 
the Bicron. This is not mine. This is uh, I adapted a probe from uh, a friend onto his lovely Bicron analyst. This is a very nice uh, unit. Oh, I can actually show you inside of it because it's easy to take apart. Um, so it's got the bias supply. It's got a battery holder here with an extra spare battery if you run out. And it's got some, um, <clears throat> basically it's got some ranging and this thing just gives you a very adjustable high voltage bias and a discriminator. You can set even, you can even set it to only trigger on a specific energy in case you're using a photomultiplier detector. Yeah, this is a really cool device. I really love this Bicron and Mike, it's going back, it's coming back to you, but didn't have the time to get it packed and, um, Okay, here's hoping I don't get in trouble for this, but I'm gonna put it on the times 10 scale because I already measured it. And um, I'm gonna try and figure out a way to not uh, get too much glare. So if I keep the probe away, oh, by the way, this is a one of the probes from an in inspector. Um, it's a LND 7315 or something pancake tube. And it used to have its own bias generator, so 400 volt power, su power supply that made its way to Marco. And uh, it's been retrofitted to just have a BNC, and you set the high voltage from here. Okay, so keep in mind this is through glass, so it's not going to see any of the alphas, it's only going to see the betas and the gammas the, this thing emits. Um, and if I touch it to the glass, you can see it gets up there <clears throat> depending on how long you let it hang out there for uh, it can go up to 5000 counts minutes so it's not that active it's not that bad but yeah this thing kind of scares me so this is the first thing you're gonna see on this channel that i will not take apart for your benefit because I am really scared of contaminating stuff around here. If you want to see somebody remove a radium dial from um, uh, a Geiger counter, I'm going to link a video below uh, to my friend All Radioactive, and he did a teardown on a DP63 with the ridiculously hot um, scale for the indicator. And um, yeah, you should look at him and the safety procedures he follows and the care he's taken into not contaminating everything. This is sealed now and it's sealed very well. All of these things were uh, very well encapsulated to prevent the ingress of moisture rather than from to prevent the radon gas and contaminants escaping. But still, I will not take this apart and I advise you, if you ever find something like this and it's radioactive, just let it be. Like, it's it's not a good thing. All right, uh, and you can see if, if the probe is reasonably far away from the detector, uh, it's not going to contaminate anything you're um, going to set it on. The, if the probe is far away, it won't even feel it. So this is relatively safe, but if you take it apart and smear that radium paint everywhere, you're going to have a bad time. Radium jaw is no joke. Okay, so uh, I actually have two of the two uh, airplane indicators that I found today. The other one isn't radioactive. Let me just take it out. I'm gonna turn off the lovely Bicron and set it aside. And this is the second indicator. Um, what is this? Well, you can see it goes up to 2.5 and I think it's a Mac indicator, like a Mac speed indicator. Mac being the speed of sound. And I did uh, a bit of a bodge here and I plugged the syringe onto the uh, intake port and I'm gonna pull it out and then I'm going to push on it and you can see that it works on air pressure. So these things run on, I think, pitot tubes. So there's two uh, tubes on an airplane fuselage on the wing and the pressure derived from the fact that the airplane is moving through the through the air uh, generates basically the pressure generator uh, deflects a diaphragm in here and it says how fast you're going um, in relationship to that pressure so 
and this being Mach 2.5, the speed of sound is about 1200 kilometers an hour, something like that is 330 meters a second. Um, this is going pretty fast. I am pretty sure that this comes from either a Suhoi or a MIG. I'm not sure the MIG can go up to 2.5 Mach, but the Suhois, I think they used to be able to. Um, and this is S, and I don't know what this letter is uh, anymore, but you can see it's the same brand that made, brand, company, uh, factory, that made this one, the, sign, the mark is the same. And um, yeah, you just have two uh, ports, probably, um, it relies on a differential pressure, so before and after the fuselage. And um, uh, I'm going to take this one apart because there's nothing radioactive inside, let me prove that to you. So I'm going to put it on the most sensitive scale, I'm going to bring it here, and there's nothing. Right? So I dare take this one apart. Um, and um, I'm going to take it apart and we'll see how it works. I'm not, just, I'm not going to bore you with that. So give me a few seconds until I take the screws out, uh, disassemble it nicely, and we can see what's inside. Be right back. Right, so, uh, by the way, these are just lovely. The more I use them, the more I realize that wood is the way to go when it comes to screwdrivers for mechanical stuff. So, what do we have here? So, I was wrong. It's not a differential pressure, it's just... Um, is just a pressure and we have two diaphragms um, one in here and one in here and we have some sort of it's basically like a watch makers mechanism they're very small components and they're made in the same style as watches because you know fine mechanics and you can see that if I push on this thing I'm already going Mach 2 so uh, let's see, if I press, if I actually, so the diaphragm that's actually actuating is this one here. So when pressure goes in, it will spread apart and it will move this needle up. Am I doing it completely wrong? I think I screwed something up in the mechanism. Oh no, look, so it's like this. Okay, so I've pressed this thing down and we're already going Mach 1.8 or something. And uh, I can't really see where the move movement is coming from. So we have a we have a pivot here. So this is a first degree lever, and this is another lever here. And they're just actuating the um, the needle basically. So and the movement has to come from somewhere else which is, it has to come from here, I think. So it's got to be from this diaphragm, but I hesitate to push it. Oh yeah, it's this one. So you can see that if I yank on this thing, like mimicking the movement of the diaphragm going up through that spring, uh, that connection there, sorry, uh, the needle goes up. What's very interesting is that you can see there's a fair few... So you can have some adjustment. You can see there are some holes drilled in that thing and in this thing as well, this arm here and this arm here and this one here. So these are, I assume, to set the, um, basically the gain and the linearity of this thing. So uh, by, moving, uh, by moving the fulcrum basically of the, uh, actuators of the devices themselves of the diaphragms and by moving these things up and down you can set the zero and you can set for how long of an expansion you need to get to mark something so probably what they do at the factory to calibrate these because you can see they've been calibrated um, due to the red I call them um, fingernail uh, finger polish marks they're not finger polish there's some paint so they hook this up to a pressure controller or something like that, a pressure generator with a pressure readout. And they know for X amount of kilopascals here, you get um, X amount of deflection in this diaphragm. And that would correlate to Mach 1.4 or something like that. So this is really pretty. It's made from die cast. Uh, I think 
magnesium or zinc or something like that. Um, and there's the mechanism itself is made from brass and the bearings are just brass bushings. So they're meant to have as little um, uh, resistance, mechanical resistance as possible. And we have three springs, which are basically, they're meant to, um, I think, resist motion. And there's some markings on, uh, on the diaphragm here, and I don't really understand what that is. And I'm not going to take this apart further because, um, yeah, it's really pretty. I want to preserve it. The other port here, I think it's actually just there in order to um, serve as the intake for an ambient pressure. Because, of course, if you, this can't be under a vacuum and you need to have a, a relative pressure between the inside of the diaphragm and the outside. And for that to happen, you have to have a very well-known pressure, for example, inside the cockpit. So this might be actually tied to the oxygen supply for the pilot or through a regulator or something like that. So, yeah, uh, very interesting. And those diaphragms look like they're made from, I'd say, copper or, or brass or something like that. They look a lot less gold in real life than they do on camera. So, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, so mock speed indicator, um, pitot tube is the thing that uh, makes it work. Let me check one more time if that needle there isn't radioactive. And thank God it isn't. Good. And um, yeah, I'm going to put this back together as carefully as I can and I'm just going to stick it on a display some, the case or something like that. Okay, let me bring out the next thing I have to show you. Just one second, I need to clear out a bit from here. And uh, yeah, so the next thing I found is a pair of things actually. Um, these are hard drives, of course they are. Um, I don't know exactly the standard for these things, what they were called. I seem to remember something about MFM, but they seem to be too, I think they're too small to be MFMs. They might be some sort of SCSI or God knows what interface. It looks very old. So I can't see any maker's marks on these. Oh, look, this is a Seagate. Uh, uh, yeah, Seagate. And this is, I think, also a Seagate, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, yet again, in the interest of uh, speeding things up, I took the screws out of both of them and I cracked the seal. And um, let's see inside. Right, so this is a very, uh, it's a three platter hard drive. I think you'll be able to see my power supply and uh, stuff like that in the reflection. And um, so the way energy density has, in, uh, information density has improved in hard drives over the year, is is they've developed more uh, performant um, magnetic materials. These hard drives, I assume, are just coated in a layer of iron oxide. So basically something along the lines of uh, like a tape, like a um, cassette tape. Uh, so they're not very good in magnetics. Like they need a lot of uh, field to be set and they're not very uh, you can see the head is pretty large and you can't pack as many in as tight a spot i think it's got something to do with the magnetic boundaries the smaller you can get um, a magnetic boundary the more information you can pack and these actually come as you can see on this one uh, it says that this one has a defect uh, defect information as shipped and you can see that somebody's written in that some cylinders and some heads uh, so a combination of cylinder and head won't be able to read or write anything um, and the cylinder refers to I think it's the axial like the movement inside the uh, platter and the head refers to which side and which platter so this is one style of making a actuator like uh, this is before they invented the voice coil as in the newer hard drives the newer hard drives i think you all know uh just a second let me bring one out 
All right, so I found it. So this is the um, read right head from a quantum Bigfoot. Um, and it sits on the same kind of bearing and that's the difference between uh, this style of actuator um, and this style of actuator, the read right head movement, is that this is a stepper motor and this has a voice coil. So this is sandwiched between two magnets and applying a, an electric current makes it deflect one way or another. Uh, this is a bit harder to control but gives you more speed and um, I'm assuming that it will give you more resolution. The very interesting thing about this uh, hard drive is the way they've implemented the um, uh, movement, the motion. So you can't afford any backlash. So what they did is wrap a tape of metal around the cylinder here and when the stepper moves, it's like one of those card tricks with the tape that moves from one side to the other, it's the same thing. Um, there is no backlash in something like this. This is how some surface grinders wheel, uh, uh, tables move from side to side. It's a very low cost way of, um, and a very reliable way of getting zero backlash. Um, this thing is also used, I think, in, um, I have no idea. Uh, so surface grinders and this thing. And uh, also, uh, there's almost no mechanical wear. So there's no pinion and rack to wear out. And the pinion and rack would have much more backlash. Uh, there's ways of uh, managing backlash in gears as well. You can have uh, anti-backlash gears. Um, I think I'm going to try and link a thing in the description. But this is one of the cheapest and most reliable because it's just a very thin sheet of metal bending and um, it's very repeatable and reliable. And we can see on the back side, I'm just going to put the top on so I can rest it safely on the board. So we can see on the back side that we have a, this is the stepper motor, uh, the driver's got to be somewhere underneath here. And um, this is the main bearing for the uh, platter. You can see that it's quite a significantly sized bearing, like compared to the bearings in normal hard drives right now, this was spinning much slower and it had much more inertia. When these things um, start, they start. And um, um, I'm going to show you the other one and I'm, then I'm going to try and power up uh, one of these hard drives and see it post basically start up and uh, see how pretty the mechanism is when it moves. Okay, so this is the first one, the, I think they're both Seagates, but anyway. Uh, and this is the other one. I have no idea about the capacity, but I'm pretty certain that this one is much older um, than the first one. So you can see very, very pretty platters, beautiful rusty uh, iron oxide color. And the way the head moves on this one is even, more interesting, it's basically the same anti-backlash mechanism with the aluminium or stainless steel strip or whatever, but it uh, just goes straight along the axis of the disc, so it doesn't move at an angle like uh, platters these days, like hard drives these days do, or like the one that I showed you previously do. So this one just goes in and out, and it's very pretty. There's a bunch of uh, fine mechanics. There's there's two ground linear rails and there's bearings that act as the ways basically of the device and um, yeah and on the back side we can see there's there's two integrated circuits that kind of get quite hot because they're they've dis discolored the pcb and there's another bigger driver here i don't know what exactly this is for anyway um give me just a second and i'll try and hook up some power to uh, the hard drives. I need to remember which of the um, pins on a connector, like a power supply connector, like the computer Molex, Molex connector is what voltage. And then I'm going to turn it on using my um, Siglin power supply and we'll see them spin up. Sorry, knocks the camera. Jesus Christ. Right, so I realized last time I went to the flea market, I bought one of these. It's an FSP power supply, it's a small form factor power supply and it's got plenty of Molexes and plenty of SATAs and stuff like that. You know the joke, Molex to SATA lose all your data. So I'm going to do the old um, uh, green to ground, green to black to turn on the power supply and look at this.
And that's just about all it does because there's nothing to ask it for data. There's nothing, nothing to tell it to write data. And um, if you touch this thing and slow it down, I think it will stall out at some point and give up. Oh no, this is a determined one. Anyway, uh, okay, so it works. It's fa fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I love the slide on that thing, the linear rail. It's very beautiful. I'm going to turn it off, let it spin down, and then we're going to uh, try and uh, turn on the other one. Let's see if that one works as well. I bought this uh, power supply for uh, exactly this kind of thing to test out old hard drives and stuff like that. I love the way hard drives wake up in the morning. Like it's they are they they they're always in such a hurry. They seem like okay. So let's plug this in and um, strap the five volts to ground again. And this one appears to be dead because I smell burning. So this one ain't going to work. Yeah. Um, I think there's a short in this one somewhere. Let's see if I managed to kill my power supply as well. So that would have been funny. No, I didn't kill it. That one's dead. I'm sorry. Uh, because it's dead, you know where, what we're going to do. We're going to make it extremely educationally friendly and take it apart component by component and take a look at all the interesting bits inside here. Jesus, I'm so glad I didn't break this power supply because... Yeah, uh, smells like hot wires. Okay, so give me a few seconds and I'll first take off this side and see what's beneath it and then we can go into the mechanics of it all, right? Be right back. All right, so first of all, you can definitely see that this thing is dead by the discoloration around it and uh, stuff like that. I'm pretty sure that it's a MOSFET or bipolar transistor or something like that. Um, it's probably gonna have got something to do with um, turning on a power rail or something like that. I'm not sure if it's a regulator. It might be. F5T might be a 5 volt regulator, but that wouldn't make much sense because there's already 5 volts on the on the SATA. And then we have a couple of integrated circuits that I don't recognize at all. And then we have a ROM, uh, an EEPROM. And it's socketed, and it's socketed in some very interesting pins in the board. And yeah, it's one of those uh, Intel D2732A. So it's a, I don't know how many K EEPROM. Uh, there's a piece of paper covering the window, so and these are erasable under UV. And this integrated circuit here from ST has got to be the driver for um, either the main spindle motor or for the... Uh, no, I think for the, st the stepper drivers have to be somewhere around here. Although... No, these are the... These, are, these drive... Yeah, so these drive the head I think they, these drive the head, these drive the stepper motor for the um, for the read right arm and um, we can see a small uh, capacitor bodge there and most of this is ground and some data lines and that's about it. I am not entirely sure about this interface. This was going to the uh, I think it was going to the spindle motor. So this driver must be for the main spindle motor. This has to be the uh, magnetic heads readout. And this driver here, this uh, connector here going to these drivers 
has got to be for the stepper that's driving the arm. All right, so uh, Synectron, made in Hong Kong. And this is a Seagate custom. What's a custom parts in here? I wasn't expecting that. So this is probably a three-phase brushless motor or something like that. Um, and this is probably a stepper, I'm assuming. Let me find some torxes because apparently there's a couple of torxes around here and I'll try and take these apart um, and we can look at the individual components. Right, so I told you I was going to take them apart piece by piece. So this is the platter, platter stack. There's three of them and I'm not going to point them at myself. I'm not going to make that mistake yet. Um, so yeah, uh, very reflective. One of the read write heads was actually stuck to it. So I think that's why the thing died. Um, the stepper that drives the uh, read white head itself around, uh, along that pivot is this one and I have no idea what it is it's very fine so the steps are extremely fine very very small and this is the spindle motor you can hear the bearing inside it so um, and this is a 696 ZZ bearing 696 refers to the dimensions I think it's a six millimeter um, inner diameter and a, a 12 outer diameter and um, the ZZ refers to basically it's double shielded so it's got shields on both sides uh, seal, sealed it's sealed uh, and it's just plain roller bearing so I might try and uh, get this um, started but eh, you know that's really not really worth it and we can look closer at the read write heads themselves. So you can see there's some very, very finely lapped ferrite. And there's a single, um, it's basically one turn or more, more turns of a coil ending here. So this is a small coil and it's basically making a magnetic field concentrated in a smaller region as possible. The modern ones have the the magnetics and the tips of uh, the the heads basically are small so small they're microscopic and uh, they're so finely lapped because they actually levitate over the surface of the platter um, by a few I don't know hundreds of nanometers or something like that due to something like ground effect so they just due to the fluid dynamics of the motion of the hard drive uh, platter spinning, the heads actually levitate a bit over the surface and they need to be extremely finely lapped in order to make that possible. So yeah, um, one dud, uh, one working hard drive, well, it's not working anymore because I exposed it to atmosphere, but uh, we got some interesting parts out of it and um, we got it, uh, got one of them at least working. It's very really pretty. Okay, um, let's get on with it. The next thing I actually got was a Quadro. Yeah, I'm swinging it with the big guys now, a proper GPU. Uh, 10 lay was the price, it's two bucks for this thing. I actually got it for the, uh, what is it, the Dell system? Sorry, the compact system. Um, I got a while back, I wanted to put an external GPU in it, and uh, there was, this was too cheap not to get. Give me just a second and try, I'll try and figure out how to fit in the next item. Actually, there's one more item I found before the big guy. So, um, in the interest of expediency, I yet again cracked this one open. Um, this is a LNBF, so low noise something. Uh, it's for TV, satellite TV, and it's basically a, a horn antenna or something like that with a, I think you can see it, there's a, uh, uh, you can't see it, there's a collector, basically the tip of the antenna is in there, and this is both a 
down converter because it accepts 10.7 to 12 and 12.75 gigahertz and it down converts it to 950 to 2.15 gigahertz this needs bias like um, it needs a dc voltage to power it because it's a uh, filter, low noise, noise amplifier, and down converter, and it, it says it's got an LO, so a local oscillator of uh, 9.75 9 and 10.6 gigahertz. Uh, I'm not sure if this is for TV itself, it might be. Romania had, so more people in Romania had satellite TV than toilets inside, so that's uh, ridiculous. So I cracked it open completely. And I can make a fool of myself by trying to explain to you some RF, which I don't know. So, uh, the feed-through, the port itself that connects to the antenna is in here. And I think we have some amplifier stages here. And then we might have some attenuation, a filter. I'm not sure if that's an attenuator, it's just a resistor. Um, a filter, more filters, uh, and this is another port, which I'm not entirely sure what it does, and it comes through here and gets filtered again and goes through this, which seems like a Wilkinson power splitter, but it's uh, uh, used as a combiner, so it maybe mixes stuff, and these are capacitors, so if you have two traces running parallel to another, they're capacitors, if you have um, stubs they're inductors like this is an inductor for example um sorry this is a capacitor this is an inductance um i'm not sure you can actually see the glare is just horrible on this material this is um a very uh special like the dielectric uh, in this pcb is very special because it has to have very low um losses in rf and we have some, uh, I think it's a, just a plain linear regulator, and we have some basically reverse bias T's. So they're meant to strip away the DC and feed it to the circuit and pass the AC to and from the thing. I'm not sure this is uh, going to send anything back to anywhere, but this it's more li most likely just a, a preamp and a down converter. Um, and let me take apart this other section here as well. Of course, the wrong bits in the screwdriver. I think this is the one. And um, I have no idea how these things actually work. I'm not specialized in RF. I just heard some people talking about it sometime. And uh, that's my understanding of RF. So, and this, uh, that, this I know. So this is a screw that moves this plunger in and out and it has something to do with an adjustment from this thing here and um yeah i don't know they could be mixers they could be whatever i have no idea um the thing with four pins might be a double balance mixer or something like that these i'm pretty sure they're amplifiers all these stages here um, this is the biasing for the amplifiers, probably resistors and capacitors, and um, this is to decouple the just to couple just the AC. So you can see there just capacitors uh, running along here. So yeah, because you don't want the DC from the previous stage to get in your uh, AC path, basically. So yeah some electrolytics or tantalum capacitors here um yeah and that's about it that's about all i know about these things i wanted to try and hook it up to the spectrum analyzer but i realized i don't have a connector for this thing and i don't know where i put my bias t's because i had a couple of them but i have no idea where they are that thing purple thing there i'm assuming that's beryllium ceramic i'm not entirely sure it might be but just look at it, it's so pretty. And I'm gonna have bad karma now because I opened RF stuff without burning a resistor to the gods of voodoo. So, 
and even this this so this would stay on the tip of a parabolic reflector one of those uh, and it's not an antenna it's a parabolic uh, reflector so it concentrates rf from a wider range and focuses it into one thing and i'm assuming that these are intentional they're meant to filter the signal i think or do something with it and uh, you can see that i keep telling you oh by barely barely in there let me try and expose for that thing in there. No? Yeah, can you see it? Yeah, it, a lot of exposure on my phone. There's a there's a thing that collects the RF from here. It's this port right here. It connects here. And I'm not sure exactly what's with this thing. Um, it might be for a different fre frequency because it says it works at uh, uh, on a broader range of frequency. So this one it might be for one frequency and this might be for another. That would explain why they want to mix them because if there's nothing coming in through here, there's stuff supposed to be coming out through here. So yeah, um, leave it in the comments. Tell me how much of a fool I am. I, I admit I have no idea about RF. So yeah. Okay. Um, the next item is, um, it's kind of big and it's in a big wooden box. Let me figure it, figure out how I'm going to, Jesus Christ, put it on the desk, frame it. And this is going to be interesting. I think you're going to like it. Be right back. All right. So I didn't even clean the mess. Pretend you're not seeing it. There's my lovely 617 electrometer. I love that thing. Um, I actually got it broken and I fixed it. If uh, you want to see inside it, uh, let me know because uh, Marco also did a video on that thing and on the nanovoltmeter I have to the left, but um, I actually took it apart a bit further and repaired it. And um, who knows, it might help somebody in the future. So what is this cheeseless thing? Uh, so I... I don't know if there's any politically correct way of uh, saying this, but um, there's some Roma people who usually bring stuff to the flea market to sell. I have no idea where they uh, get the stuff that they sell, and they obviously don't know what the things that they sell are. Um, most of the times they focus on stuff like consumer electronics. There, there's ancient record players and uh, bits out of hospitals and stuff like that, like um for example i once saw some some guy had an, one of those automatic electronic defibrillators that you find in subway stations and stuff like that in um abroad and um a brand new in box he wanted an arm and a leg for it and uh, they're dangerous so i didn't touch it um but uh, this thing just literally popped out i think it's an oak box and it's it, it's done like finger jointed uh, at the edges it's in very good condition uh, considering its age uh, the only thing is that there's a bit of rust on the hardware and uh, there's a bit of I think there's been some moisture damage on the thing itself on the crate itself because it's there's a few spots where the wood is losing uh, it's gripped into one piece is losing its grip to the other by the way let me show you the casper scale so these are the cats for scale there's ravioli there's pesto and uh you can see it's about three catfuls worth of a box so uh get on with it what is it well um i'm gonna crack it open and let me see if you can figure it out from here. Well, I think it's given itself away because you can kind of see the writing. But this is a capacitance standard or something like that. It's a variable capacitor, I think made for metrology purposes. Like you can, you can set up to, I think, a microfarad down to the nearest picofarad. Um, in decades and this uh, is a variable capacitor here with a vernier scale and it goes up to 180 picofarads or something like that and you can connect your thing to be calibrated here and you can trust this implicitly and calibrate your capacitance meter 
or for example you can calibrate the electrometer uh, in its charge function so in order to calibrate the charge it needs to inject the current uh, through a capacitance and measure the rise in voltage and that's how it deduces the charge uh, this was actually I was kind of ripped off on this comparing to what I found on the internet that these things go for but in a moment you know I was young it was raining I didn't know what I was doing so I bought it and I paid around 20 something euros for it equivalent and um, it seems to be in perfect working order some of the contacts seem to be a bit um, um, iffy but there's nothing some WD-40 can fix and um, hey Pesto you want to see what's inside? She's such a royal pretty cat. Okay, uh, <laughs> um, pastel, it's rude. Stop looking like that at me. <laughs> um, she's got a question. This is a cat having a question. So I'm gonna take pesto away from here. I'm going to take this out of the box, show you inside the box, and then show you what's uh, what's in here actually, because it's uh, quite interesting. Um, I did a preliminary test with my 87.5 and um, it's pretty reasonably accurate, like it's bang on if you ignore the last digit, which I don't trust on the fluke, so um, everything from one microfarad down to, I don't know, a couple of tens of uh, nanofarads is perfect, so I would trust this pretty, pretty consistently. Um, okay. Let me take the cat and uh, take this apart and show you what's inside. One interesting detail, uh, which I will mention now, but I don't really have a good way of showing, is that there's two screws here which fix the thing to the box itself, and they're cross-drilled, so the screw head is cross-drilled for a seal. So this thing, when it was calibrated or assembled, it was factory sealed and you weren't supposed to touch it. And one more thing, uh, the inside of the box is completely covered in copper tape, copper foil, sheet, whatever, uh, in order to shield it. And the connector here, the earthing connector, the guard terminal or whatever, is also connected to that copper foil when you close the box. So this is really nice. The box itself was, in my opinion, completely worth what I paid for the thing. And um, yeah, I think I'm going to take it apart completely, uh, sand, clean the hardware out, sand it down, fill in a bit of the gaps with uh, some uh, wood putty or something like that, and give it some tongue oil or um, some boiled linseed oil or something like that. Uh, it will brighten and bry it up and uh, make it all pretty and new. Um, yeah, so... Let me take it apart and show you what's inside in traditional gears and gears style. What's up, kitty? Look at the feeties. Look at her jelly beans. She's so sweet. Yes, cat. I know. I know. Uh, they haven't. They haven't been weaned properly, and um, my dog, who's uh, the best dog in the world. Uh, she's such a sweetheart, she's got such a good temperament. She sometimes falls asleep and um, I've seen them, I've like caught them several times uh, nursing on her, you know, nipples. So cats nursing on a dog's nipples, with dog which has been spayed, sterilized, never had babies or anything like that. And my dog is just like, yeah, that's fine. I'll deal with it and they keep like purring and massaging her belly and they're so confused I the, the they saw a nipple and these I think I'm gonna insert a photo of them you should see they're just so crazy cute yeah okay uh, enough with the chitter chatter let me take it apart and show you what's inside all right so I haven't figured out a very good way of taking this thing out of its box but here it is. It's really heavy. Uh, cat didn't want to go, so I had to allow her to stay here, right? 
What can you do? Look at her. She's so sweet. Jesus Christ. She's going to grow into a very beautiful cat. Like, she's very fluffy and she seems very regal. Like, she's a queen or something like that. Okay, go. Right, so, what do we have here? We have uh, several banks of 10 capacitors. These are one microfarad, 0.1 microfarad, these are, these are uh, 10 nanofarad, and these are 1 nanofarad capacitors. And this is a variable capacitor, this can here. And inside there, there is a uh, mechanism, which basically it's a, like one of those multi-turn potentiometers, but it's actually got a, a, gear, a gearing of some description. And it's very simple, so there's two bus bars, two copper, thick copper traces, which tie each block in parallel, because capacitors are added to each other when they're put in parallel. So, um, and each block itself puts a number of these capacitors in parallel, from w w just one in parallel or none, so completely disconnected, to more and more and more. So you can have 10 100 nanofarad capacitors in parallel, then another 10 of 10 nanofarad in parallel, and then 10 of uh, one nanofarad in parallel, and this is always connected. So if you turn it to zero, the plates inside, I'm assuming, are completely out of mesh, and if you fully wind it in, they're completely in mesh. So, yeah, it's very pretty. I'm going to bring you in for a closer look, but this is just an overview of the thing, and I'm going to try and carefully take this shield off. Uh, there's a couple of screws holding it uh, in place like this and a couple more screws holding it in there. Somebody has been inside here before, um, which worried me a bit, but then I checked it and it works perfectly. And um, yeah, it's not particularly low leakage or low high performance or anything, but these are very nice capacitors by the looks of them. So they're all uh, glass to metal seal, um, they're all hermetic and they're 0.5% tolerance. I, I think they're selected. So I think they're actually better than they they might be binned. Uh, and just so you know, the box is completely shielded in copper tape inside. So yeah, let me uh, take this thing apart and uh, I'll show you a bit closer what's going on in here. This wasn't fun to carry around, by the way, at the flea market. Got a, very, a lot of very strange looks from people. Jesus, that was not worth the effort. Okay, so it's just one of these regular capacitors with the half disc plates. And as I said, when they're fully meshed, they have the highest capacitance and when they're open there's nothing so yeah there is a couple of screws so let me explain this was like this and there's a couple of screws down there and a couple of screws up here you can't see them but in order to take apart this shield you need to take apart the screws down there and i did that with this, like an extra long screwdriver, and with the universal joint, like all those things, uh, these things at the end. Holy crap, that was exhausting. Um, I'm not gonna put it together the way it was, I'm just gonna put the shield on in however many screws I can, and call it a day. Um, let me show you a few details of the capacitors in here. So, these are the 10,000 picofarad ones, and they're up to 250 volts, and they're, um, I don't know if you can see the tolerance on it, but they're all 0.5%, and if I get it to focus where I want, but that will be significantly, significantly more difficult than it sounds, um, you can see that these capacitors are hermetic. And there's a glass to metal seal on each and every one of them. So, yeah. Uh, 
Sadly, the switching isn't very easily easily accessible, and um, frankly, I can't be bothered to take it apart even further because it's working, and I want to keep it working as it is. And I already had to resolder one of these terminals, and it's snapped on me again. So, um, yeah, I'm not gonna bother it anymore. I'm just going to put it back as best as I can, and. Um, uh just find a place for it because my house is getting increasingly crowded after all these uh flea market finds videos like i and i don't feel like i think i'm pretty much a hoarder by now because i can't get myself to uh throw anything away all right so that's about it i'm gonna leave you with this and um I'm gonna have um, I'm gonna have another video up I think tomorrow about what uh, Yaromir so, uh, sent me and um, if not I'm sorry but as always thank you for watching this is almost an hour again and um, have a great day and come back next time bye